are, wherever you are, and whenever it is, you are catching some brain waves coming to you from the banks of the burgeoning and thriving St. Brain River in the number one boom town in all of America. That's right, it's Longmont, Colorado. I'm Becky Peters, and across the table is the only co-host who Thomas Friedman followed back on Twitter. It's Ben Kalb. Ben, what's good? Oh, it is all good, Becky. It's a new year, a new me, new decade, new podcast. I'm Not quite sure where I was going with that, but uh, I'm feeling super lucky to be bringing giants in education to the earbuds of busy teachers everywhere. And man, oh man, do we have a doozy for you today. He's Thomas Friedman, and it is going to be fantastic. Uh, We know it's a new decade, but am I the only one who thinks the new decade stuff is getting a little bit played out? Like, if one more person that I haven't seen since before break comes up to me and says, I haven't seen you in a decade. <laughs> I might have to do something super drastic, like unfollow them on Twitter or something. Oh, no. Yeah, that's probably a little too uh, drastic there. But I shouldn't be so grumpy. As humans, we only see so many changes of the calendar in a lifetime, and it is super neat to change decades. And so I did a little uh, research into the epic ways people closed out the 2010s, and I want to share my three favorite. Are you ready for them, Becky? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in Vegas... Ariana Grande and Imagine Dragons and a bunch of other famous people performed at a hotel, and then they put an ice skating rink on the roof. What? I know it's not fish, but it would have been pretty cool, right? Yeah, I guess. Uh, Then in Brazil was the biggest New Year's Eve party with two million people packed in on a four-kilometer stretch of infamous Copacabana Beach. So basically, like, the entire city of Chicago packed onto a beach the size of a fun run. Gross. Yes, pretty awesome. Uh, And then there was a really neat one where a private charter company called Private Fly uh, chartered G6 Airlines across the international date line. And so you got to celebrate the new decade twice in one night. Hmm. So that's pretty neat. And then next year, I guess, SpaceX is taking the first tourists to the International Space Station. So Let's go. I'm there. I'm there. It's only $50 million a person. Oh, perfect. We can get Brainwave listeners to support us. We right? will. Yeah, just click the like button and we'll <laughs> get to go. Uh, which of those would be sound the coolest to you, Becky? I don't know. I like I like the International Space Station. I want to be on a roof ice skating rink. I think that would yeah, be Yeah, that great. sounds pretty cool. Uh, now, all those are, sound really neat, really cool, But and I hate to be that guy, but Becky, you and I actually ended our decade on something that dwarfs all of those put together. Because our decade ended with a visit from the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend. Thomas Friedman helped us close out our 2010s. So amazing. So that's obviously my favorite. And if you told me in the 2010s that I was going to get a chance to both see and ask questions to one of the most notable authors of the most famous newspaper in the history of our country, it would have been about as improbable to me as heading to the moon for New Year's Eve. But it's true. I remember reading The World is Flat years and years ago, and it sparked so many conversations. And I've read and reread his new book, Thank You for Being Late. And on our last night before winter break, when you would think that teachers would be fleeing for their eggnog, Thomas Friedman came to our district and spoke to a packed house of over 500 teachers and administrators and literally blew the roof off with messages of self-motivation, kindness, and humanity. And Ben and I were lucky enough to collect the Q&A from the audience and facilitate, and it was both terrifying and awesome all at the same time. But the best part is that we get to repackage all of that wisdom from his talk and his books into this episode for all of you. So in this episode, we're going to share some highlights from that night by playing you some of his message and then following it up with some education-relevant connections. We'll also link to the full video of his talk in show notes, and feel free to give that a watch as well. So you come into these things thinking, like, I, like, man, I was so nervous. What could I possibly contribute if he and I strike up a conversation? You get imposter syndrome. He's so smart. and He's learned so much. So it was really great when the very first thing out of his mouth was... Well, I am a public school snob. I went to public school in Minneapolis. My kids went to public school in uh, Bethesda. My wife is a public school teacher. My daughter did Teach for America, was a public school teacher. I am a public school snob, and you are my people. So thank you for what you do. Um, What a cool reminder. We're surrounded by like a literal throng of 
champions in public education. I grew up attending private schools, actually. I don't like to admit that much because I work for public schools now, but uh, public school was always a mystery to me, and I didn't have the greatest perception of it, to be honest, because I only heard negative things. And still, these days, it's so easy to get bogged down scrolling Twitter and seeing snarky memes and GIFs about low teacher pay or lack of public support for our work, and it can feel really discouraging because we feel like we're alone. But we have to remind ourselves and each other that this is the hardest, most challenging, and most rewarding profession to be a part of. 90% of the kids in this country go to a public school, so the nation's success literally depends on us and our paranoid optimism. That's a Friedman term. We're going to come back to that later. So it was cool to hear the most popular journalist in the world. He's married to a teacher. He encouraged his daughter to become a teacher and told us that we're his people. If that doesn't lift your spirits this decade, I don't know what will. Absolutely, Becky. That is spot on that, uh, yeah, the world wants us to succeed. The nation wants us to succeed and, and they're depending on us. Uh, and along those same lines, the first question that I asked Thomas Friedman uh, after I'd completely pitted through my sweater. It's I, true. I was right next to It time. was That's rough. <laughs> I was so terrified. But I asked him. In the intro to thank you for being late, you state that you enjoy being a translator from English to English. You have a insane ability to take complex topics and make them very easy to understand, and that's driven your success and captivated us all tonight. I'm curious as to what were the educational experiences you had as a student in Minnesota that helped to build up that skill set? What can the teachers in this room learn from the teachers that taught you? So I, I was real lucky. I had that teacher who changed my life. Up to 10th grade of high school, I wanted to be a professional golfer. Uh, that didn't work out. And, um, but in 10th grade, two things happened. I, I had an amazing journalism teacher named Hattie Steinberg. We had an amazing high school newspaper and yearbook, and Hattie ran both, fiercely competitive. And I, uh, the only journalism course I've ever taken is her course in room 313 at St. Louis Park High School. Not because I was that good, but because she was that good. Never needed one afterwards. She taught me to start all good journalists start their day with the New York Times, and which was, <laughs> which was then mailed to Minneapolis, so it got there a couple of days later. But um, she was a woman of uh, she was strict, a disciplinarian, serious, tough-minded. I mean, she was a. I, I sit up straight just thinking about her now, you know. <laughs> and she was 62 at the time. I had her as a teacher, but we gathered around her room like it was the mall shop and she was Wolfman Jack. <laughs> she was the essence of cool. We all wanted to be, we all wanted to please her. And she taught me to be a journalist. And I got my start on the high school paper. So just another striking example there of how we never know what's coming through our classroom doors. I wonder if Hattie Steinberg had any clue that at 62, she'd end up teaching one of the most famous journalists and authors in the history of our country. So listeners, don't underestimate your impact. Don't write off the year. You never know who you're teaching and what impact you'll have on their trajectory. Yeah, especially for our elementary teachers. They may never see or hear about the impact they had on their students. A lot of that impact manifests too far in the future for us to appreciate. So today, remember to look at each of your students as if they are the next Thomas Friedman or the next Maya Angelou or whatever inspires you because they all have so much in them. But getting back to the content of the talk, we all learned about periods in time where change was so fast or so dramatic that when we use an extreme term like a revolution, which is usually reserved for physical conflicts or wars like the agricultural revolution or the first or second industrial revolution, we can think back about those as times where things changed rapidly and irreversibly. Well, as a lasting message of Thomas Friedman's body of work is that the word revolution doesn't even begin to describe the change we're experiencing now. He instead maintains that we are going through a reshaping of our world, which really should prompt us to try to understand it and each other as much as we can. He quoted that night and Mary Curie stated, now is the time to understand more so that we can fear less. And according to his research, the changes that we're experiencing now are unlike any those our planet has ever seen because the accelerations are threefold and also synergistic. We have the climate changing, the market and how we work changing, and also technology changing. It's easier for me to remember them by the three M's, Mother Nature, Market, and Moore's Law. Each of those impacts the speed of the change of the others. And so we're at the base of this huge exponential curve on all three of those very complex fronts. And if it feels like things are changing fast now, hold tight because the pace will actually feel slow in 10 years because that's how exponential change works. Remember back to you know those graphs that you learned about in high school math, they look like hockey sticks, increasing slowly and then just taking off. Even Einstein said that compounding is the most powerful force in the universe. 
worse. The way that Friedman explains this exponential change, Moore's law and exponential growth in general is pretty useful, so let's listen into that. Moore's law is the mother of all hockey sticks, technologically speaking. Moore's law was coined in 1965 by Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, who posited at the time that the speed and power of microchips would double roughly every 24 months, but the price would stay roughly the same. And that's what happens when you double something every 24 months. You get one giant accelerating hockey stick. There's a famous story, Andy McAfee and Eric Benjolson tell in their book, The Second Machine Age. It's told in Silicon Valley about the man who invented the game of chess and gave the game to the king. And the king loved it so much. He said, how can I reward you, good sir? And the man said, your highness, all I want to do is feed my family. And the king said, well, shall be done. What would you like? He said, I'd just like you to take uh, one uh, kernel of rice and put it on the first square of this chessboard, and then two on the second, four on the next, eight on the next, 16 on the next. Just keep doubling it. My family will be fine. King said, it shall be done. Not realizing that when you double something just 63 times, the number you get is roughly 18 quintillion, which was more rice than existed on the planet. That's what we've been doing with Moore's Law. We just keep doubling and doubling and doubling. I suspect this PowerPoint is running on an Intel 14 nanometer chip. It has 35 million transistors per square millimeter. Uh, Intel last year began shipping its 10 nanometer chip. It has 100 million transistors per square millimeter. Your eye cannot see it. Now, what's the difference between 100 million and 35 million? Very hard for us to grasp these exponentials. The difference is the difference between a self-driving car that needs just a little box under the front seat of the car to contain the brains of the car, and the old one that needed the whole trunk of the car. And Intel can tell you exactly how they're going to make the seven nanometer chip. Now eventually we're going to run into physics once you get below 3.5, but we'll find some other ways. That's what quantum computing is about. So for the last, uh, see, 1965, 54 years, every year someone's been writing, Moore's Law's over, Moore, Moore's Law's over, Moore's Law's over. And what all those authors have in common is they were all wrong. It's alive and it's well. Intel, uh, last year, actually two years ago now, invited me in to do the last interview with Gordon Moore. One of the great thrills of my life. And um, he, uh, they, uh, Intel's uh, chief at the time told the story that kind of in honor of uh, Gordon's retirement, they um, asked Intel's engineers to take a 1971 Volkswagen Beetle and try to calculate what if this Volkswagen Beetle had improved since 1971 at the same rate microchips had? And so they did the math and they calculated that if it had, that Beetle today would go 300,000 miles an hour. It would get 2 million miles per gallon and it would cost 4 cents. <laughs> You'd be able to drive it your entire life on a single tank of gas. That, folks, is the power of the technological exponential driving your life and everything you're trying to do and keep up with and enable your students for in this world. Right there, that soundbite there is a great example of how Thomas Friedman really is an amazing translator from English to English. That's a very complex topic that I'd read about and heard about other places, but his explanation of it is still my go-to. And it helps me not feel like such a crotchety old man when I get confused between TikTok and Twitch, because really things are changing fast and it's okay that I'm not keeping up. And at one point he said, We're at a point now where technology is actually accelerating faster than the average human being can adapt. But accelerating at a pace that we can't adapt to isn't okay. It sounds like a gloomy future, like, hey, things are changing fast and we'll never keep up. But he said there is hope. Uh, really, there's two options here. When things accelerate too fast, we can curl up and hope it passes, and he says it never will, or we can be resilient and propulsive. And he says that one of the best ways to learn how to be resilient and propulsive is to look at a mental model that did an incredible job keeping up with change through resilience and propulsion, and that is planet Earth. Who do I go to for advice on how you get resilience and propulsion in the middle of all these climate changes. And then I realized I knew this woman. She was 3.8 billion years old. Her name was Mother Nature, 
and she dealt with more climate changes than anybody. So I called her up, made an appointment, went out to see her. I said, Mother Nature, how do you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? She said, well, Tom, I have to tell you, everything I do, I do unconsciously, but these are my strategies, she said. Uh, first of all, I'm incredibly adaptive. You see, in my world, Tom, she said, it's actually not the strongest who survive. It's not the smartest who survive. It's the most adaptive who survive. And I teach that lesson through a process I call natural selection. You may have heard of it. <laughs> Secondly, she said, I am incredibly entrepreneurial. Oh, Tom, I'm the most entrepreneurial person you've ever met. Wherever I see a blank space in nature, I fill it with a plant or animal perfectly adapted to that niche. I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Third, she said, Tom, I am, I am, I am the most pluralistic person you've ever met. I love diversity, she said. I try 20 different species of everything. I see who wins. And I noticed, she said, something very interesting she mentioned to me. She said, I noticed, Tom, that my most diverse ecosystems are also my most resilient and propulsive ecosystems. I love diversity, she said. For she said, I'm incredibly hybrid and heterodox in my thinking. Nothing dogmatic about me. I'm extremely experimental and pragmatic. I'll try any trees with any soils, any bees with any flowers. I'm incredibly hybrid and heterodox. A fifth, she said, I'm a lifelong learner. And I take all my learning and turn it into new DNA to pass on to the next generation. A seven, she said, um, I, I'm completely open source. I let anybody fork off anywhere, try anything. Eighth, she said, though, Tom, I do believe in the laws of bankruptcy. I kill all my failures. I return them to the great manufacturer in the sky, and I take their energy to nourish my successes. Well, my argument is that if we're in the middle of three climate changes at once, in the market, Mother Nature and Moore's Law, it's actually the company, the country, the school district that most closely mirrors Mother Nature's strategies for building resilience and propulsion when the climate changes, that is the one that will thrive in this age of acceleration. So using the Earth's reaction to change is a useful mental model for us to consider as teachers. How are we embodying those seven or eight characteristics for resilience and propulsion in our classroom? So Ben and I are gonna pose just a couple questions about how we are doing this, you know, how can we do this a little bit more intentionally in our room? So like the first one he mentions is adaptability. So how are we helping students build that skill of adaptability? Are we giving choices that build that skill? Are we allowing them time and space to process things in their own way, or are we just asking them to copy our notes off the board and then use those when they do their independent work? Are we asking their opinion and truly listening to what they think, or are we trying to shape them in what we want to see? He also talked about how Mother Nature is entrepreneurial by filling space with perfect animals and plants. So are we seeking student input and advice and allowing them the chance to solve classroom and school issues using the concepts that we've helped to build their knowledge around? He also talks about diversity, and that's a, a massive, massive topic that we cannot do justice to here in a minute or less, but we can think about diversity in thought, diversity in representation, diversity in the kinds of ideas that we're exposing our students to, and a question that we can ask ourselves for every activity we do, are we seeking out diversity and speaking directly about racism, classism, ableism, and other types of bias when we see it? Are we ourselves modeling lifelong learning around those topics? I was trying to catch up on the Clear the Air chat or last night on Twitter, and a side thread was about how to challenge colleagues when you hear bias in them and how to do it in an open way so as to invite conversation and change. Lurking on Twitter has been eye-opening on me for many issues of those isms that I've really been blind to my whole life because of my whiteness and my privilege. Teaching Tolerance is also an amazing resource for this. There are so many ways that we keep ourselves blind to the diversity of this world by just taking a back seat on the lazy river of our lives instead of swimming to new areas and getting out of our comfort zone and talking to new people and learning new things and learning to honor the humanity in every other person and examine and fight our own systems to see where humanity is not being honored. So no matter where you are, we all have so much work we can do on that front. Another characteristic he mentioned is the law of bankruptcy. So he said that Mother Nature kills her failures and then takes the energy from those to devote to new life. 
in this reshaped world, we need to fail fast and move on. As teachers, are we acknowledging our own missteps in front of our students and colleagues and then moving on? Or are we stubbornly clinging to our ideas because that's what went to our plan books or we thought it would work back in August? Those are awesome questions, Becky, to think about and and how answering them positively can help us mirror that mental model of Earth. But the converse side is worth looking at as well. Here are some questions that can help us identify if we're working against those same characteristics. So when it comes to adaptability, are we decreasing adaptability when we reward just compliance? Are we decreasing entrepreneurial thinking by allowing every blank space to be filled with something, some activity, some busy work, some worksheet, some, we're telling them exactly how to do things? How might we encourage more time for diffuse thought and processing? Listen back to our episodes with Manoush Samrodi or Cal Newport for some ideas on really why you should not always have continual distractions. Are we decreasing entrepreneurial thinking when we expect students to be able to create or think deeply about something without first exposing them to a strong background knowledge? Sometimes that leap can help, but most of the time, it's super frustrating and counterproductive to a student. I think back to our interview with Natalie Wexler about the importance of vocabulary and background knowledge and comprehension, and even just looking at the life of Thomas Friedman. He was a history and language major before he started creating best-selling books and articles. He needed background knowledge, and background knowledge always comes before meaningful creation. Are we decreasing diversity by letting our own voice be the loudest or most powerful in the room? Those are really good questions for all of us, Ben. Thank you. Um, Because a lot of the times, it's not our fault, but our intentions don't match the outcomes we get a lot of times. And we have to be aware of that so that we can do better. So the world is reshaping faster than we can react to it. And when I look at those characteristics of Mother Nature, especially the adaptability, the reaction to failure, the entrepreneurialism, I see this idea and theme of constant improvement and lifelong learning. And it's something that Mr. Friedman emphasized again and again when he said... If you are not ready to be a lifelong learner, you can no longer be a lifelong employee. And then again, when he said that the biggest divide in the world isn't anymore who has internet and who doesn't. That still exists, but it's getting better. But the biggest divide in the world is not going to be the digital divide. It's going to be the self-motivation divide. Whose kids have the self-motivation to be lifelong learners long after they've left home and mom and dad are not there to say, Donnie, have you done your homework? And again, when he gives parents advice that... Mom and dad, never ask your kids what you want to be when you grow up. Because whatever it is, not going to be here unless it's policemen or firemen. Only ask your kids how you want to be when you grow up. Will you have an agile learning mindset? Will you be inspired to be a lifelong learner? That is the single most important competitive advantage. Hearing his advice on just the importance of lifelong learning made me kind of feel stagnant in my learning. I really want to be characterized as someone who's constantly remaking my knowledge set. Uh, Even just hearing the question that Mr. Friedman asks when he goes into a successful organization He doesn't ask about their new products or how much money they made the last quarter. He asks them, What's the tip of your spear? What can you do today that you couldn't do before? So it's lessons from Earth. It's lessons from the most successful companies and organizations around the world that inform how he raises his kids. And one of my favorite parts of the talk that night was the advice that he gives his daughters. Tell my girls five things. First, always think like an immigrant. How does the new immigrant think? The new immigrant thinks, man, I just showed up here in Denver, and there's no legacy spot waiting for me at the University of Denver. I better figure out what's going on here, see where the opportunities are, and pursue them with more energy and vigor than anybody else. New new immigrants, Armenian friend taught me this, are actually paranoid optimists. They're optimists because they left somewhere bad to come to somewhere better but they're paranoid that it can be taken away from them at any moment. I tell my girls every day, think like an immigrant, because girls, you are new immigrants to the age of acceleration. Second, think like an artisan. Think like an artisan. I got this idea from the Goldens at, at Harvard. Who was the artisan? Artisan was that person in the Middle Ages who made every item individually. 
Every saddle, every stirrup, every plate, fork, knife, dress, shoe, tablecloth, chandelier, the artisan made individually. And what did the best artisans do? They took so much pride in what they did, they carved their initials into it at the end of the day, into the silverware, into the saddle, into the stirrup. Do your job every day as if at the end of the day, you want to carve your initials in it. Because that means you brought so much unique extra to it, no machine and no algorithm will take it away from you. Think like an artisan. Third, think like a starter upper in Silicon Valley. I learned this from Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. Reed likes to say in Silicon Valley, there's actually, there's actually only one four letter word. It's actually not four letters, but it does start with an F. Um, and the word is finished. If you ever think of yourself as a finished product, you are really finished. Reed's motto is always in your own mind, be in beta. Beta is the stage in the development of a software where you just got it good enough that you want to throw it over the wall, have the community test it, find the glitches, throw it back. You work on it some more, throw it over the wall again. They work on it, flip it back. His argument is always be in beta. Never think of yourself as finished. Otherwise, you really will be finished. Fourth, this was a point I made in The World is Flat. I'm a big believer in the equation CQ plus PQ is always greater than IQ. Oh, you give me a kid with a high curiosity quotient and a high passion quotient, I'll take them over a kid with a high intelligent quotient seven days a week because they will find the answer. They will find the answer. CQ plus PQ is always greater than IQ, and those are such ingredients for lifelong learners. And lastly, always, always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis, my favorite restaurant growing up. So um, uh, when I was working on my book, this was a previous book, I was back home and uh, having breakfast with my best friend Ken Greer at Perkins Pancake House on uh, France Avenue and Highway 100 in Minneapolis. And at 7 a.m. in the morning, I ordered um, three buttermilk pancakes and scrambled eggs. Ken ordered from the waitress three buttermilk pancakes and fruit. And she came back after 15 minutes, put her two plates down. All she said to Ken was, I gave you extra fruit. I gave you extra fruit. I gave her a 50% tip. Why did I give her a 50% tip? Because that waitress didn't control much, but she controlled the fruit ladle. And that was the source of her extra. What was that waitress doing? She was actually thinking entrepreneurially. She showed up at the 7 a.m. shift. There were only two guys, two yokels in the restaurant. She thought, I'm going to give one of them an extra dollop of fruit and just see, if, see what happens. And I happened to notice, and I gave her a 50% tip because she was thinking like an entrepreneur. Whatever you do, whether you're a teacher in this school district, whether you're a mechanic, whether you're on the factory line, always be thinking entrepreneurially. Where can I fork off here? Find a new opportunity, a new business, uh, a, a new way of doing things. There's myriads of ways to do that now, and it's really essential. So if you take nothing away from this talk, just remember this. Always think like an immigrant. Always think like an artisan. Always be in beta. Always remember that CQ plus PQ is greater than IQ, and always, always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis and be relentlessly entrepreneurial. So those are all amazing pieces of advice there, Becky, but which one resonates the most with you? I, my favorite one, I almost jumped out of my chair when he started talking about Reed Hoffman and said, always be in beta, because one of the schools that we work with, uh, Skyline High School, has had that up in a room on a poster in their uh, STEM engineering classroom, and it just says, always be in beta. And I talk to students about that all the time, and I, I try to remind myself of that all the time. And I love the way he said it, if, you're ever, if you ever think you're finished, you're finished. That's yeah. amazing. How about you? Yeah, uh, and I push back against that because I kind of want to always be an alpha. Oh, yes. But yes. no, I, that was incredible. But the one that really resonated with me was the idea of artisanship and doing everything as if you're putting a stamp on the bottom of it and carving your initials into it. I remember teaching 
and even in my role now that I think like, hey, if certain people don't see this, I don't get credit for it. And I would rock a lesson and wish my principal was in there to tell me I did a good job. And I wish I had Thomas Friedman's advice then that my initials go out on every single lesson, every single day. And it's not just when an administrator is in there to see me doing it, that my initials go on it. So I want to remember that with everything I do, that I'm stamping a giant BK on the bottom of every email, every interaction with a student or with a colleague. And I want to have that artisan-like mentality. That's beautiful. So we're going to close up shop on this episode. But before we do, we're going to scoop an extra dollop of fruit on Get our Get you some of that. Plates. Get you some of that. <laughs> and share just a couple more connections from the talk. So one that really keeps sticking with me, uh, and we've played with it a little bit in some of our discussions, but it's around identity. When he talked about how confusing identity becomes in this reshaped world, that where we used to easily identify ourselves as liberal or conservative or, you know, these different binary things is changing. He gives this example. Let's imagine today I'm a steel worker in Pittsburgh. Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday, I'm in the steel union. I'm with, I'm with labor. I'm with Bernie, 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 Bernie. But on Saturday, I drive for Uber. And on Sunday, I rent out my kid's spare bedroom on Airbnb before I go shopping at Walmart for the cheapest made Chinese goods. And what I can't find there, I download from Amazon.com. <laughs> oh, on weekends, baby, I'm with deregulated capital. Which party am I in? Which party am I in? And that's why all these parties have blown up at the same time. And they've really just become identity vessels. But they are no longer the kind of coalitions of shared interests. We're actually in a transition I think, from this binary list to a much, to a totally different grid of politics. People sometimes accuse me of being a centrist. I say, uh, excuse me, I'm not a, a centrist. That implies that I mush between your right and left pole. I'm actually not on your grid anymore. And I love how he says that people try to label him as a centrist, but he replies that he's on a whole new grid. And I wonder how we can bring some of that thinking into teaching. We all know that we as humans have a binary bias and our brains love categorization and love patterns and hate uncertainty. So it's understandable that we try to put ourselves in one box or another. That's why the myth of, you know, I'm left brained or I'm right brained has been so prevalent and has remained there for so long. Why we continue to love personality tests, why we continue to dismiss the value of something that seems opposite to something that we value. We've all heard of the pendulum swing in education, and I really see that analogy as a symptom of our binary bias, and I, I want to invite us all to live more like Mr. Friedman on a different grid. So there are these cross-cutting divides that we've self-imposed in our minds, in our teaching minds, basically. Like, project-based learning is not the opposite of explicit and direct instruction. Technology-enhanced learning is not the opposite of reading something valuable from a textbook. Maybe it used to be, but in this age of acceleration, let Let's, let's not be okay with identifying ourselves as one brand of learning. We do our students and ourselves a disservice when we plant our flag on one side of a meaningless and arbitrary binary divide. So let's be open to practical knowledge. Let's be open to research and let's make ourselves a new grid. Wow, Becky, so, so true. Uh, let's keep each other accountable on that and live in on a whole new grid. I love that. Uh, another message he ended on and mentioned several times was really the increasing importance of treating people how we want to be treated, the golden rule. Uh, it's crucial in this time when things are changing so much that we as a community really take care of each other as we get more technological. He said the faster everything gets, everything old and slow gets more important and matters more than ever. I actually think the faster the world gets, everything old and slow matters more than ever. One of the questions Becky asked was, how can we stay ahead of tech changes? And he responded, basically, if you're a kind, decent, lifelong learner, you're going to be okay, whatever the tech is. Along those same lines, we know that on this show, we have long been calling our listeners marigolds because they're helping teachers around them thrive based on the work of Jennifer Gonzalez. But I want to add a new descriptor, a new name to listeners of this show and teachers everywhere that are navigating this rapidly changing and reshifting world. And that's when Thomas Friedman talks about the I people. So let's listen here. That's why basically my book and my talk has a theme song. I actually explored whether I could buy this song. When you open the book, you'll play this song like a Hallmark card plays Happy Birthday. <laughs> and the song is by one of my favorite singers, Brandy Carlisle. And the song is called The I 
E-Y-E, and I believe it is the anthem of our time. The main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. Well, I believe, folks, we are in a hurricane. That's my three accelerations. And we have leaders around the world who are trying to build a wall against the hurricane. I'm actually trying to build an eye, an eye that moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but creates a platform of dynamic stability, not frozen stability, but dynamic stability, like riding a bike. And that's the healthy community, a place where people can feel connected, respected, and protected, that can move with the storm and draw energy from it. I believe the great struggle in our politics going forward is going to be between the wall people and the eye people. And my book is a manifesto for the eye people. Thank you very much. So let's not only be marigolds, let's be dancers in the eye. Dancers in the eye. We're eye people. I loved that part. So please, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Share your responses, insights, ideas, or thoughts on our Twitter feed or on our blog at brainwaves.com, where you can actually find transcripts for new episodes now, by the way. And as always, have a great generic time of day. 